Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of Cinema Rediscovered, and welcome to Rewriting Film History with the Women in It, part two. Um, I'm Camilla. And I'm Rachel. Um, we're Invisible Women. We've got another Invisible Woman, Lauren, in the first row over there. Um, you may remember us from last year. We did um, a panel called Rewriting Film History with the Women in It, part one. <laughs> uh, however, in, on Zoom. And we're really happy to be back here for part two. We're a feminist film collective, and we try to um, rewrite film history by putting the women back into cinema history where they belong. And we do this through loads of different things, um, by putting on screening, by working with lots of partners who are here in the audience today, and through doing panels like today. And Rachel's going to tell you a little bit about what we're <laughs> so, although this is part two, you do not have to have seen part one. Um, basically, what we're going to talk about is different ways that we can reframe film history and change our ideas about how we talk about um, the history of this amazing art form. Um, we're going to have a focus on some of the films that are in the Europe Made Hollywood um, strand of the festival. It's an amazing selection of films from the kind of golden age of Hollywood. So we're talking like kind of, um, I think it's like 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s is normally what we say for golden age. Um, and what's interesting about that strand is it talks about how <laughs> loads of talent from Europe came um, to America during this period and kind of built this very this, this art form that we think is very American in this kind of quite subversive and interesting way. Um, and when we talk about this period, we tend to talk a lot about some quite big name directors like Murnau and von Sternberg. Um, but actually, there are loads of interesting female stories that are part of this period of time as well that maybe we don't talk about as much, or maybe we talk about these women, but we talk about them in a certain way that doesn't privilege their artistry. Um, so that's a little teaser. We'll dig into that a little bit in the conversation. Um, having said that we'll have a focus on those films, though, we're going to range far and wide. Like, I don't know where we're going to go. We have some amazing <laughs> experts on this panel who have loads to say about lots of different eras of cinema. Um, so hopefully we're going to have a really fascinating and rich discussion. We're going to talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll open up for questions. I'm amazed so many of you are here. I was just saying I would not be here at 9.30 <laughs> for this discussion. Um, so thank you for coming and we really hope that you can participate as well. Um, and there's also some really intimidating experts in the audience. Um, so please be kind to us. We are um, enthusiastic generalists. So <laughs> please be gentle. Um, so to introduce our speakers, um, I'm going to ask them to say a few words about themselves because they both have incredible multi-hyphenate careers. Um, but we're delighted to be joined by Israel Kasi and by So Mayer. Um, yeah, so maybe Isra, you could go first and just say a bit about yourself. Sure. Um, so my name's Isra, and my background is in um, cinemas and community venues, so um, sort of outreach and audience development. Uh, but in terms of curation, I'm also the co-founder of Tape Collective, which started as a small collective a few years ago, and quite similar to Invisible was Women was all about sort of bringing films back into circulation um, and sort of championing films that are excellent uh, and in particular films by women of color who sort of didn't get uh, the recognition they deserved. Um, I also work with Bird's Eye View, so I'm the head of programs there, so I've got something to say about films by women. Um, hi, I'm So Maya. Um, I'm part of a queer feminist uh, film curation collective called Club des Femmes, uh, and I think I've seen some of you at our events. And we are also um, committed to bringing archive film uh, and under-seen films back into circulation and supporting new films, and particularly opening up spaces of discussion and context uh, around films, as we'll be doing today, because when stories get lost or suppressed, you have to think about how to tell them so that films can be seen in their fullness. Um, I'm also a writer, uh, and my most recent book is A Nazi Word for a Nazi Thing, which is actually partially the story of two people who got rejected by Hollywood. Um, Sergei Eisenstein, who is a European who was definitely um, welcome only for his style, not his ideas, um, and Louise Brooks, uh, who was an American who went to Europe, so presenting an interesting contrast with some of the people we'll be talking about today. 
um, yeah. Amazing, thank you. Just to say quickly, this session is being recorded as well, um, just so you're aware. Um, I don't know if you can object. <laughs> I don't think you can. Um, so yeah, just be aware that you might be <laughs> captured on, a, on film. Um, so Camilla, do you want to kick off with a, a meaty question? Yeah, I think um, from what Rachel was saying just now about this idea of often of, of these European kind of great men that were in America, like Murnau and and von Sternberg actually leads quite nicely into something that stuck a lot with us from last year when um, Pam Hutchinson in her opening lecture talked about this um, idea that when we put a director's name before a film, then you're kind of giving that ownership to, to the director and possibly um, pulling away from others. So what we were thinking about is that, or what one of her suggestions was, we believe, is that um, one way to approach a film is to look at authorship elsewhere. And for example, what we wanted to think about with Queen Christine, Queen Christina being in the program, obviously, and then Greta Garbo, what would it look like if we looked at, Queen, at, look at a film as Greta Garbo's Queen Christina? Or like last year's example, uh, Jane Fonda's Clute, which is something that we talked quite a lot about in our panel last year. So, how does this kind of reframing um, change the way that we think about cinema history, if we kind of look at it from that lens? And we'd like to start with you, Isra, um, to, to hear your thoughts about sure. this. I think, I mean, I think this is sort of an ongoing conversation to this day in terms of how we want to reframe things, and it all comes down to star power. Um, and I think that's great to sort of, something that we discuss in Bird's Eye View is that we often have pr people approaching us saying, we've centered a woman in this film, will you represent it, will you support it? But for us, it's really important to have that gaze of, of being made by a woman, whether it's written by or directed by, so that we have that sort of perspective as opposed to a man writing about a woman. Uh, no matter how, you know, how much they've perfected the details, mm -hmm. uh, and no matter how much if a woman watches it and goes, oh, that's, you know, I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's sort of looking at actually who's telling the story and where's the narrative coming from. In terms of reframing the narrative and, and sort of looking at the star instead, we can do that, but it's like not applicable to every situation. And Absolutely. it works in that because the Greta Garbo had such star power um, and has such an incredible legacy. But it also sort of, at the same time, we're trying to champion other skilled crew and storytellers. Um, so for example, you've done a season on in terms of like someone who isn't a director mm -hmm. and someone who's an actor but actually cinematographer uh, producer, uh, producer. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> she did like four jobs so yeah. it's because she did like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but is an actual you know is a producer and also even when we talk about producers the big names that we listen you know that we hear and I'm sorry to say this but it's like Jerry Bruckheimer remember him and like <laughs> Feige, um, and like um I guess Reese Witherspoon as well, like as sort of an example of people that you will put forward as a big name producer. But it only works if the filmmakers think, or you know, the producers or studios think that that serves a purpose with the audience. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately it's just not sort of um, consistent and it's not something that you can take from era to era and film to film. Um, and I think it's interesting to look at if it's something that we're sort of like as a retrospective look at and go, mm -hmm. okay, you know, the sort of significance of it. But also there's something incredibly disposable about that star yeah. mm -hmm. because, the, the, you know, Greta Garber, for instance, it's, it's, it was an aesthetically pleasing persona that worked and it was sort of um, an actress that disappeared you know, after mm. sort of reaching a certain limit because there was nothing else that could be given. And I think it's different if you're looking at something that we considered consider a skilled contribution to a film, not that acting isn't skilled, but a sort of contribution in terms of something that you can do past a certain point. Mm -hmm. So should we maybe backpedal then and call it Salka Fertel, Salka Fertel's um, <laughs> Queen Christina, who was the screen? Who, who wrote the screenplay for it. Yeah, so Sal Kavirtel, just uh, to give some context, is a really interesting figure at this period and very much an invisible woman in a way that we like to think about it because 
Um, she's someone who is quite hard to define what she did. She was a writer, she was an actor back in Austria and Germany, um, and she moved to Hollywood with her husband in like the late 20s. Um, and she became good friends of Garbo and came up with lots of projects for Garbo. And together they tried to kind of get those projects off the ground, but also Garbo could be quite, was very picky about her roles, um, and it could be quite difficult to kind of get projects going. But from my understanding is she conceived of the idea for Queen Christina and wrote the first draft. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's a really interesting thing to consider, especially if you've seen Queen Christina. It's a very interesting film about gender. Um, and also there, uh, yeah, Salk is complicated and interesting in lots of ways. I wonder if you have any um, opinions on this, so in terms of specifically around that film, I don't know if you have any ideas about how we might talk about it, or also just um, Greta Garbo is a star, star is authorship. Any thoughts on um, that? I mean, when we're, so when we're talking about Queen Christina as well, we might want to reframe the title of the panel as rewriting gender minorities or marginalized mm. genders uh, into film history. This is a time, um, I'll be talking about this a little bit more tomorrow with the film Laws of Love, when gender and sexuality are really understood um, as being involved with each other. And Queen Christina is one of the films that sort of that we have from the time that is working that out, one of the few mainstream films that is opening up in a very small way that space of um, looking at um, ways that people might live otherwise and be living otherwise, which becomes very associated with Europeanness. Um, you couldn't have cast an American star as Queen Christina. Um, in terms of like the star in general, the thing that I completely agree with Isra that this is era specific, it's also national cinema specific. Um, I think when we're looking at the, the golden era, whatever, studio cinema, what's interesting is that to look at audiences who are the most neglected people who make up cinema, and we know that at the time that was a majority female audience for studio cinema, particularly in the Anglophone world, and the way they understood the film was Greta Garbo's Queen Christina. They didn't know about Salka Viettel, or, you know, unless they were, you know, reading the trade press for gossip, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, <laughs> But stars were the authors of films for a lot of audiences, and that was not a naive pr proposition, as work by people like Jackie Stacey and Stargazing have shown. There was a really intense understanding and fascination with how these very powerful figures created and were being created, how they resisted the studios, you know, the fascination of Garbo leaving cinema, um, or people coming back when they were older and older roles, but this really intense, um, often erotic relationship, which goes to what Isra was saying about this person as a commodity, and that that's very difficult to position as some kind of aesthetic authorship. But for audience members, there was definitely a sense in which these films rose, lived and died on who their stars were. And the stars were the authors of them, were the authors of the main characters, of the love um, stories, but also of the story with the audience. And so for me, the most valuable thing about thinking about the star as author is respecting and remembering and going back and looking at how audiences responded um, to films and how they took them into their daily lives. So um, Laura Horak in her book, Girls Will Be Boys, has this fantastic section about trouser wearing among uh, women in America and how all of the media attributed it to the influence of Dietrich and Garbo wearing trousers on screen and off screen. So there are slacks that become known as like Dietrich slacks or Garbo slacks, and there are pictures of you know, just young people wearing trousers that are always reported on through this lens of this is some kind of star attraction, this is star authorship, which both goes to the, the commodity, the hyper-visible um, commodity, um, and speaks to how audiences are authoring these stories for themselves and finding in particularly these European figures forms of modernity and modernism that perhaps as like, you know, working class women uh, would not have otherwise been as available to them. So that's, that's sort of what excites me about that reframing. Absolutely. And it's really interesting to think about this idea of um, kind of, of, of the audiences. I don't think that we had, we had really thought about it when we mm. were thinking about it, and, and even fandom. And um, I think that's really, those are, are really interesting points that I think we hadn't really thought about when, when thinking about this. Um, but, 
Yeah. I'd like to just pick up on, um, I mean, I would love to talk more about trousers anyway. Yeah. That's a really <laughs> amazing subject. Um, another interesting thing about Sal Cavieto that we should point out is that one of the things she did is she set up a kind of salon, basically, um, in Santa Monica, where she had a house, where which became a meeting place for Hollywood talent and emigre talent. Um, for intellectuals, European intellectuals, as um, the 1930s wore on and a wave of um, refugees came to Hollywood, she became kind of a, a place of home. Like she used to make apple strudel for them and they used to talk um, kind of about ideas and talk in German and it became a creative and intellectual hub essentially. And I think I'd like to think a little bit about the role of the kind of soft power that women have exercised historically. I'm thinking about Polly Platt as well, because something that she did in the 1970s and 80s and 90s is link talent together in a really creative and interesting way, and in that way become a kind of author of those projects that she worked on. And I think Salka's role as a connector is not necessarily understood as like a creative and mm. important force. And it's really important and interesting to acknowledge that that's a huge part of making films. It's a collaborative art form. And introducing these people and allowing them to meet is a really important way to kind of um, help that art to happen and to create space for that art. Um, and maybe that's a segue into talking about the queer communities of Hollywood during this period. <laughs> so would you like to talk about this? <laughs> sure. Um, I think one thing that's really interesting about the salon is it's not part of making Hollywood films before, really, Sarko Vietel. And also, I mean, depending on how much you believe Dietrich's uh, extremely uh, self-promoting autobiography, she also cooked, <laughs> apparently, um, for directors like René Claire. And she certainly was someone who helped people get visas, and mm -hmm. um, but she sort of paints her, paints herself as like Muta Malena <laughs> in that book. Um, we, yes. Uh, so the Salon is a, a European form. It's an upper middle class, particularly Jewish women's form um, that is very operational in the intellectual and the visual art world. So someone like Gertrude Stein in Europe is really well known for bringing together people like Picasso. It's also um, sort of implicitly rather than explicitly queer in a lot of senses, um, but it certainly, um, as you say, shifts how things get made because it's a center of power in some ways that's outside studios. It's very dependent on that kind of upper middle class inheritance and on the perception of a certain kind of Europeanness that has that like class association that has whiteness. Um, that knows the codes uh, of engaging with the intellectual language, uh, the codes of engaging with the food. So um, it's a sort of, it is this liminal space and at the same time it's linked to all these very legible codes of power. Um, it's not gonna be somewhere that a runner could go and start to, mm -hmm. you know, it's very much about the people who are already um, arriving with those talents, but it, it brings up this, um, this really interesting question of like, what does European mean mm -hmm. in the title of this program and what we're talking about? So just as a thought exercise, if we think like, what if fascism hadn't risen across Europe, you know, would we be having a program called Europeans in Hollywood that was focused on the people who came in the twenties and in the context that Hollywood is already a European settler colonial project. Mm -hmm. Everyone running Hollywood studios is a European by descent, if not immediate arrival. Um, and the lines between talking about like an immigrant and a settler colonizer like get very blurred when we're having this conversation in particular. And what blurs them is people arriving as refugees from fascism, mm -hmm. um, which is another generation on from Dietrich and Garbo and Vietel, although they understand the situation and they make the context for those people to arrive and be accepted. Um, and so European and developing into the 30s starts to have this association with refugees fleeing fascism, which if you're a sort of Hay Hayes Code person is also, mm, those people are communists. They're like, you know, promiscuous. We don't want anything to do with them. And then it comes to have this association with queerness um, and marg people of marginalized genders. Like, and that's all bound up with communistness and Jewishness. I don't know, do we want them? So it's very important to have a salon space where you can have these conversations because there is a lot of hostility. There's anti-Semitism, there is homophobia, there's misogyny, um, all bound up with this idea of Europeanness, there is anti-communism. Um, and at the same time, it is this very closed 
world. And it's not like this is a queer community that is fighting for LGBTQ rights and going Mm -hmm. out there and being public about it. We know about the sewing circle retroactively Mm -hmm. as people who can access diaries and archives and work by people like Judith Main. People at the time that, that, you know, there were intimations, those fans were like (laughs) reading the gossip pages and, you know, gaydar has been around since forever. (laughs) But it it wasn't making some public space in which queerness, alternative genders, alternative politics, or even Jewishness could be visible. You did it there and then you went and made yourself as white as possible for Hollywood. So... I don't know. It's complicated. It's complicated. It's complicated. And they were, they were, it was a space in which to be complicated, because in Hollywood you couldn't be. And I think that um, maybe spirals out, interestingly, because another thing that's important to acknowledge is that during this period there are non-white actors, stars of colour, um, people working in various um, ways in the film industry who are not white European backgrounds, and their contributions tend to get even more buried or limited by the circumstances of the time, by racism, by prejudice, by these power hierarchies that have, you know, kind of, there's a a certain type of correct exoticism, you know, Mm -hmm. and there's a certain type that isn't so correct or so palatable um, to mainstream audiences. And that's something, or uh, through the eyes of producers anyway. Um, So that's something that has been kind of a constant through time. And we still have this um, sort of hierarchy of um, different kind of exotic other foreign narratives. I wonder if you want to talk about this at all, Isra. Um, could be around contemporary Hollywood, could be around kind of historic stuff, but what's your view on this as someone who works a lot on um, projects talking about identity and immigrant identity particularly? Sure, I mean, there's a couple of things. The first thing is obviously that we, um, and we can see this in politics as well, that's happening at the moment, where there's an excitement because there's a sort of diverse representation um, and you sort of go, oh, how exciting, it's someone who's like non-white and they're, you know, the lead or whatever, but it's always just one person. Um, and I think for a really long time, we've sort of settled for one person representing uh, a large group of people. And again, this goes back to the gaze and the narrative of it. It's like, you're representing a story told by someone else. Um, and it's only now I feel like stories are being told by people of color, like actually taking ownership or being given the opportunities um, to tell their own stories essentially which obviously back then was more about um, what's ha- previously happened is that there's that one role uh, that someone's going to get uh, and that there needs to be a certain sort of allure uh, and exoticism like you said and I think also with the idea of sort of otherness um, and things being exotic is this idea of sort of projecting the defiling of something or of a character onto another culture or another mm. country as opposed to if we're trying to talk about like the purity of Hollywood or trying to talk about like the purity of American women it's easier than to fob that off to someone who's like European um, or from somewhere else um, and to sort of um, yeah project that that persona onto them so that you still have that representation um, there's also something about sort of leaving, you know, home. So the sort of these actors that are heading to Hollywood and becoming Hollywood stars, um, whichever country it is, whether it's the UK or Sweden or Germany, there's an element of, uh, you know, we're losing Michaela Cole to Marvel. <laughs> you know, there's like, it's still happening. Where there's still no sort of, and it's not so much about the roles being issued, it's about nurturing talent. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up in Sweden, and there's definitely an element of like, if you make it to a certain level, where do you go? And you can feel that way, whether you know you're sort of in a small town or wherever. But it's like this idea that all roads lead to Hollywood, mm-hmm. um, and possibly if there was a better nurture and a better sort of um, championing talent domestically, then we wouldn't be losing this sort of to Hollywood. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. Did you want to mm-hmm. jump in there? So. Um, yeah, I was just um, really struck by this idea of nurture, the word nurture, because the roles that non-white 
actresses in particular are generally cast in on nurturing the white talent. So there's this reversal where they're often expected to, uh, you know, Samir Ahmed gave the example of imitation of life. Yesterday, they're expected to take care of the people who already have all the privilege. And I was particularly thinking of what would it be like if instead of saying René Claire's The Flame of New Orleans or Marlena Dietrich's The Flame of New Orleans, it's a very obscure Dietrich film, um, we said Teresa Harris's the Flame of New Orleans. And this may be one of the reasons it's so obscure. It's one of the few films in which Dietrich has a close relationship with another woman. Um, because she's black, uh, the power dynamic, Dietrich is um, her employer. It's understood there could be nothing romantic or erotic happening between them, even though at one point, Teresa Harris's character appears in Dietrich's bedroom with a gun to protect her, mm. which is an image that I have not seen in another golden age film. Her character is extremely agential. She has her own love story. It's not incidental. This film was directed by René Claire. It's his first film in Hollywood. And he just understood it as like, well, this kind of Moliere-ish, Boulevardier script and you know in Moliere or in Mozart like servants are always getting the upper hand they're the clever ones they're smart they make everything happen and that's um very much Clementine's character and it's an extraordinary performance and it is one of Teresa Harris's only credited roles even though she also appears in Babyface some of you will remember Chico um she does have a credit for that but not for Professional Sweetheart um in which is sort of like a pre-make of Illusions in which she gets to perform on the radio for one night as Ginger Rogers um and of course it all goes gets goes to bust and she disappears out of the plot but um an amazing Amazingly, uh, Ginger Rogers' character is called the Purity Girl. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely playing on exactly what Israel was saying about um, scapegoating or stereotyping and also pushing a joke onto mm -hmm. non-white characters, having them always, they never get to play the romantic lead or the straight person. Um, and then Harris sort of disappears from Hollywood apart from Val Luton's films. But if we t talked about her as an author and the way that she moves from Hollywood films to race films, that she comes back as an older performer, that she always talked very critically about Hollywood, mm. um, that start, we start to sort of understand what we're talking about here is not stardom necessarily, we're talking about labor politics. We're talking about workers' rights. We're talking about um, exploitation. We're talking about how to s where there was organising and where there wasn't, um, and particularly how that changes the the you know anti-communist and then McCarthyism comes in where there was solidarity and where there wasn't. How people made careers when they couldn't make careers. What compromises they made, including the high-powered um, white European mm -hmm. stars who were still subject to studio contracts. Um, and it's sort of what it does is, is flip how we talk about film on the head and we start to see it through this lens of like a, a worker's history and the workers against the bosses and the constitution of the studios and that is exciting and I think if we take Teresa Harris as our lead into that as someone who played workers on screen and um, whose work is always being made invisible even though she's the one who enables the star to shine and we start to think about what okay, here's someone who is a nurturer and who doesn't get nurtured. Mm. That just turns how we do film history inside out, and it's, it's thrilling, yeah. It's so. super thrilling, yeah, yeah, it's really exciting. I think it's maybe important um, to yeah. then acknowledge that, um, just because you mentioned it there around um, kind of McCarthyism, is how the, you have this period in Hollywood where you have these um, kind of, particularly the European wave, working actively, and a period before, like, at the, I mean, in the 20s, they were actively invited by studio bosses to come, and then you have the refugee wave as well. Then you have this people kind of making what they can within Hollywood, and then you have the backlash after the war of McCarthyism, which um, affected lots of the people that we've talked about, particularly people who were other in some way. So Salka Viertel, her salon dissolved, basically, because a lot of the people that she was inviting around were effectively kind of blacklisted or pushed out of the industry after the war because they were associated with communism or left-wing politics. Um, you also have, for instance, someone like Lena Horn, I think is really interesting, who kind of had to fight to continue her career and distance herself from Paul Robeson, who had been mm -hmm. labelled a communist, in order to do that. So that kind of destroyed potential bonds of solidarity. Um, and this, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that this kind of workers' politics angle also had this like very... A disturbing backlash that then would go on to reshape the next kind of decades of Hollywood and leave this like very long dark 
Sinister Shadow as well. And the idea of Hollywood switching from becoming kind of a safe haven sort of for some people to a very hostile place, actively hostile for a lot of people who previously had been kind of sort of maybe welcomed in mm. with a little bit of kind of, yeah, hedging around that. Um, that just, it really strongly reminds me of, I think, I think it was Meryl Streep standing up in 2016. I think it was at the... Uh, what the foreign critics awards and saying you know Hollywood is a bastion of liberalism and you could just see like people <laughs> you know like all the white women <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, and you know Hollywood loves to have this image of itself mm. as like driving social progress mm. um, on screen and you know, we're not going to care about what happens off screen, which is why thinking about labor politics, about solidarity, mm. about like, is the salon as useful as a union? Like, can it lead to mm. a union? Mm. Who gets invited to that salon and who doesn't? Um, are they just sitting around talking about communism or are they going like, we have to find ways to open this up to like working class people um, working in Hollywood? Um, you know, that, that myth of Hollywood is so important to look at as well. Mm. And the way that... Um, so many people betrayed colleagues, distanced themselves from colleagues, abandoned colleagues, um, and that there were people who had been involved in Hollywood who, who did stay loyal to their ideals as well, even when they were blacklisted and continue to try and um, make work that told um, alternative stories. Um, I think both both sides of that are true, but the, the machine of the institution of Hollywood was never going. Mm to support people in that crisis unless it was like you know the one the, the wonderful narrative of like oh yes we're rescuing so many people who will who don't know how the american studio system works and they'll work for us at much lower rates mm -hmm. ka-ching <laughs> you know <laughs> it's always got a capitalist function it's, it's not a deal a, you know a gift <laughs> yeah yeah and um, what time is it is it good to open up maybe yeah should we open up does anyone um, have a question yet or thoughts or comments. Oh, <laughs> um, can we go over to the end first? Do we have a Remy mic, or is it just shouting at this point? Might just be shouting. So, do you want to pick that up? I mean, I, you know, I haven't done the, f the first hand research, so I just stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, so, Jackie Stacey's book, Stargazing, is a combination of looking at letters to fan magazines um, and oral history. So, she managed to speak to, you know, the book was written in the late 80s and early 90s, and she was interviewing people of her mother's and grandmother's generations. Um, so, it's like, it was an absolutely brilliant project, a moment of recovering this, this trove of memories. People shared diaries, letter, letters that they'd written to each other. Um, in Britain, there's also, you have access to the mass observation archives where like, particularly during a war, people write a lot about film. Like that's one mm. of their ways of understanding and managing uh, the, what was it like Gone with the Wind screen for like, three and a half years or something. Um, <laughs> continually sold out shows. Um, and we can talk about obviously the problems with that film as well. Um, so having access obviously to, to oral history and personal um, writing, 
is is one way in. Uh, and then also there, there were the equivalent of fanzines, I don't know um, about in um, pre-war Korea whether that's true. Um, so yeah, absolutely, the, the mainstream is not a good um, way of accessing that information. It's about getting closer to the source as it is with studying any fan culture. Um, I think whether it's today looking at K-pop fans or looking 100 years ago, mm. um, it's about hearing it from um, the people to whom it matters about the ways in which it matters. And that's like, that is a huge challenge because there aren't many people from that generation necessarily who are still around and available to talk. Um, and it would, the source material, the fanzines and so on probably haven't been translated or may not even have been preserved. And so a lot of archival work is just crying over <laughs> absences and then thinking about ways to reconstruct them that are better than reading the sexist and often classist opinions in, in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And knowing how those sexist and classist opinions continue today helps like read them in the past so it might be that it's a comparative project as well of like well we know what people are saying now about fans so how does that help us reconstruct what wasn't being said mm. um but yeah i i really recommend stargazing at uh, two words uh as, as a book and also galen studlar's work on american cinema fandom um yeah but there's no there's not like a magic I don't know if you know magic <laughs> solution as well. No, I, I mean, I think there's always, I know this doesn't really answer the question, but it's important to look at everything because that's quite telling as well. Mm. Um, and I think one of the sort of, not so much about research and archive, but even films, and I'm quite interested in sort of how we choose to, I think it's more important to like, not to use the word sense or anything, but we can't be dismissive of of what's out there, but actually you know, whether it's a problematic film, to actually look at it and from our point of view go, right, this was said, this is problematic, mm -hmm. but it was said. Um, and I think that's more important than going, this is an issue, I don't want to, you know, I don't condone this or I don't, you know, mm -hmm. I don't agree. Um, and this is so wrong. It's actually just far more important to look at it. films, research, archive, everything. It's all very valid. Um, and then to look at it from our perspective, basically. I think that question raises some really interesting ideas around taste hierarchies and whose taste we value and whose mm -hmm. taste we think is valid. Um, you know, like historically, like female tastes have been seen as kind of a bit more trivial. Like you see the the reframing of Douglas Sirk away from women's movies, you know, to the discovery of him as, oh, he's actually an auteur, it's okay, guys. Like, it's fine. <laughs> um, it's not just uh, films that women go to to cry at. There's something there that's important. Mm. Um, and I also think, Israel, it's really interesting because I don't know who's familiar with Tape Collective, but they you program a lot of things that I would say are like, fan favourites that you didn't mm -hmm. realise were fan favourites until you guys go, this is a fan favourite. Yeah, yeah. Because the <laughs> audiences the audiences who love those films are not necessarily the audiences who we listen to. So like you pull things out of the cupboard and I'm like, of course that's a really yeah, fun, yeah. amazing <laughs> film. I don't know if you have any examples of things you've screened recently with that kind of Well, I, I keep going on about Zola uh, <laughs> and it's like a year old, uh, but it came out uh, so we were actually doing a season at the moment, and I talked about this briefly yesterday, if anyone was here yesterday, I'm sorry that I'm repeating myself, but we're doing a season at the moment, uh, which is called Jump On It, and it's looking at curious source material, because it's really, really fascinating, and we're talking about based on a true story, mm -hmm. um, and the films that we're screening is Magic Mike XXL, uh, the, <laughs> the sequels, good right, they're a good one, yeah. <laughs> um, Hustlers, and Zola. Uh, but also a running theme is that it's all about sort of sex workers and it's all sort of using, I think in the copy I wrote something about gyrating being used as like a, a sort of, uh, we're trying to look at like American uh, recession and sort of the structure of workers in the States through these sort of sex, sex workers on screen. Um, but also quite importantly what we do is we take up space in terms of this has to do with representation as well, is like Zola is about a black woman by a black woman who saw it a year ago. I don't know who saw it, you know, who watched it a year ago when it came out. Um, it was distributed by Sony, which is quite a big distributor and studio. What did they do to make sure that a young black audience were aware that they could come and, you know, that they should come and watch this film? And like, because I think beyond sort of who's making the film, who's distributing it, there's also a really important conversation in terms of 
how are you promoting it? And you know, this is also a responsibility for venues and cinemas in terms of who are you welcoming into your space. Um, but that wasn't a question. Was it? No, that was the question. No, it's great. I just wanted to hear you say gyrating. Oh yeah, gyrating. <laughs> I'll say it again. Um, so it's things like that, and and obviously now we're dealing with things which is like when we look at retrospectives, retrospectives and sort of cult classics. So. When we started, we called it could be called classics. Mm -hmm. If we just, if if these, because I'm not saying that there's enough stuff out there. There's always more that can be made. But with Club de Femme and Tape and Invisible Women, the point is to say there is stuff out there. So like, let's not forget that. Mm -hmm. And there's something incredibly tragic about us forgetting it. Um, and this is also, we work a lot with short films as well. Um, and the reasons why we work with short films is like who can actually make a feature film these days like it's really hard it's always been really hard and so if we're looking at films by mixed heritage filmmakers or if we're looking at films by women um, or sort of queer filmmakers then we can do that it's easier through short films because there's a sort of drive in terms of making them uh, if you're unsupported um, I was on a roll. Do you, <laughs> do you, shall I say a quick thing and yeah, see if you're wrong yeah, yeah. So <laughs> one, one way that Club Day Fam have found that we hear viewing histories is by doing screenings. Yeah. And um, I mean, with Zola, even with such a new film, you might get people coming and saying, oh, I watched it on a legal streamer and I'm yeah. so excited to see it on the big screen. And this is how it circulated in my friendship group or like we circulated all this, these memes of it, but we mm. haven't got to see it. And that is also spectatorship history. And it tells you way more than reading like some of the dismissive reviews or tells you yeah. about why those reviews were dismissive. So curation screenings have such a huge part to play in gathering um, spectatorial histories and it may be that someone comes like just thinking about like some of what Sarah was saying last night and says oh my mum talked to me about this film or my my grandma or you know auntie or a school teacher talked to me about this film and mm. I never saw it mm. and now here I am seeing it and I remember that they you know absolutely loved this star and had a picture that they had cut out of their um, then movie magazine I don't anyone who has been to Anne Frank's house or a touring exhibition like one of the most moving bits is her like wall of film stars that she had cut out of film magazines and remembering that like everyone at that time and you know as now would have done that and that gets handed down like you know my mum was a huge Marilyn Monroe fan and so I grew up first of all I thought that was, it was my mum's like weird sister that we didn't talk about because <laughs> I'd never seen any of her films but you know once I saw her film so stardom does also and um, fandom rather gets handed down through families, yeah. through learning, through screenings. And so that some of those generational memories might still, you know, come out through a screening of a film or through contacting people who are screening films and creating situations in which people don't just watch, they talk mm -hmm. as well. Exactly. Yeah. Well, this is the thing, and I had so many points, I started a lot of them, and then I now will finish. The one point was that, in addition to everything in terms of trying to bring in audience and trying to clear license rights, we're also talking about having this exclusivity, where it's like, when you're programming, you also have to say, oh, it's on Netflix. Like, um, mm -hmm. things are on Netflix, things are on Prime, things are on Disney. It's really hard. Um, but there's a sort of added thing, as Zola, I don't think is anywhere. Um, but it's about sort of reframing the, the sort of... Because it's, again, the representation is, you know, people think that's enough. It's like, okay, it's based on uh, a black woman's tweets and that's great, but who's actually watching it? Mm. And so we're trying to create that space where who we think that the film is meant for can come and see it. And in addition to the screenings, we're doing a pop quiz afterwards. Um, because there's something about reclaiming the space of like film trivia uh, and film knowledge, where I think even like this sort of space where we're sort of, there might be a fear of, things being too academic or what's your background mm -hmm. what do you know what's your knowledge and it's like it doesn't matter mm. <laughs> I'm sorry I know that a lot of years have gone into sort of trying to learn things and reading and researching but actually ultimately some of it really just comes down to what do you like why do you like it whether it's because mm -hmm. you've inherited a like mm. um, like I grew up in quite a religious household uh, and and pop culture was frowned upon but my parents were really into Egypt, Egyptian cinema and Iranian cinema because in their eyes, that was halal. Like yeah. everything else was like, you know, if I, but it was really funny to me because they sort of don't like that I work in film, but 
they need to recognize that actually comes from their passion as well of them sort of you know, just because it was black and white doesn't make it okay kind of thing. It's all the same. It's all the same industry. Um, so it's all this sort of, yeah, like in terms of why do you like it? And, and you know, it, with tape especially, we, t- we just do not talk about bad and good films uh, because it's about what conversation are you having afterwards and what conversation are you having about it and A for effort, it was made. Like a lot of the films that we work with are low quality, Mm. low budget films because that's what they could do to tell the story. Um, So we never try to look at sort of quality um, in terms of that because someone will have watched it on a good day and they will have loved it and then someone else has a bad sort of... um, like I can't watch films with Sam Rockwell anymore because a pr- <laughs> like a pr- I have a friend who like was really really into him and she was just like now I'm just annoyed about it so every time was like I look at Sam Rockwell I can't watch Sam <laughs> but I love Sam Rockwell but that's like an example in terms of how we associate films yeah you need Sam Rockwell desensitization I'm, honestly I was like <laughs> I just want I need to wait to miss him because right now I just feel like it's too much sorry. <laughs> Um, your Zola screening's tonight, right? Tonight, I'm going yeah. back to... If anyone's in London that. tonight and wants to see Zola and then go to a quiz about it... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the venue? Gen- Genesis, and my Genesis land, London. Nice. Yeah. Best don't advance. Um, questions. We went off on a really big tangent, and we Sorry. won't do that for every question. Um, Pam, go for it. Shall I yell? No, I can't. There's no one more. There's no one more. I think they didn't think I'd leave the show. Hello. <laughs> Big Teresa Harris fan here. Um, I just wanted to say, in response to talking about the whole Jane Fonda's clute thing, that this conversation had me gyrating with pleasure. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, My entire point was to say, don't just assume one name is the only name that goes in front. Whether it's Greta Garbo, whether it's Viertel, whether it's Teresa Harris or Renee Clare, I just love this idea, open up the conversation about who's... Who is the who is the way into the film, and just avoiding always putting everything in the, in the same column we've put it in before. Mm-hmm. And so everything you said has just made me bounce up and down. <laughs> so this is just an expression of love for the oh, panel. And uh, yeah, someone else can ask a clever question now. <laughs> <laughs> has anyone got a clever question? <laughs> I was gonna I was there. gonna hazard a film recommendation. I'm sure Pamela already knows this, or many people will. But um, a very underseen film called Women He's Undressed about the costume designer Ori Kelly, um, who of course has links to Bristol, um, (laughs) which does exactly what Pamela's saying of like, what if we look at a costume designer um, who was who was gay? Who ran a salon for gay men in in Hollywood that bridged the thirties and forties, um, and again was one of these secret spaces where power was exchanged, but also as a place you could be yourself. Mm. Some people, um, <laughs> never one person in particular. Um, and it's an absolutely brilliant documentary by Gillian Armstrong that very uses these imaginative reconstructions to get at the inner life through the costume. So it's not just that it puts. Um, a different name in front, it puts a different skill in front. Mm. And so whether that's acting, costume, which are in particular very feminized skills that are valued less than cinematography, which is seen as a very masculine, masculinized skill. So it's also about bringing to light craft and different ways in which we imagine and engage with films. Like for some of us, watching films is about watching Mm. gyration and costume, like (laughs) dance and clothing and makeup are very powerful sensory ways to engage. Mm. And when we say, you know, I don't know who the costume designer or magic like XSL. I don't know. (laughs) 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 Props. Rather give them the credit, you know. But a lot of credit's gone to Channing Tatum, for example. I don't know why. Because well, that's part. Well, I do know why. But, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the point of the season as well. Is like it's sort of supposedly based on his life story, which I, which is just Aww. really funny. Um, someone yeah. designed those pants. <laughs> someone, yeah. someone, and someone dressed him. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, has anyone got a question to throw in, or an observation, or a film recommendation? Or if a request for film record. <laughs> yeah. Or do you, Camilla, do you, do you guys want to say anything? Um, I mean, I, I think we touched on loads of really interesting things. I think it's really great that we um, have such a diverse panel to talk about these different approaches. I love that we started at Queen Christina and we ended at Magic Mike. I think that's amazing. Um, that's essentially the same film, right? I mean, I think we should do a double bill. Maybe that's the request yeah, that we were looking for. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, something that we actually wanted to uh, ask you guys towards the end is whether um, what you guys are really excited about, we're very excited about something that you're involved in tomorrow. So maybe you wanna kind of give a little bit of a teaser of um, what else we can see at Cinema Rediscover. Oh, I mean, there's there's so much to see. I'm very <laughs> excited for Door into the Sky, which is coming in like 10 minutes. So we will end on time so mm -hmm. everyone can get into that. But I am going to be introducing a UK premiere tomorrow, which I think is the first time I've ever done that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's especially exciting because the film is 95 years old. And this is its UK premiere. It's called Gesetze de Liebe, uh, Laws of Love. And it is a great challenge in some ways to auteurism because its writer is its director, sort of. It has a very strange history. It is a documentary um, about the animal kingdom, the birds and the bees specifically, <laughs> but also some hermaphroditic snails. Um, but it is also a campaigning film to end the anti sodomy laws in Germany. And it contains a 30 minute cut of different from the others considered to be the first ever um, explicitly gay fiction feature film. And when I say explicit, I mean there's a lot of sighing and yeah. looking sad and playing the violin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by 1927, it was you know, considered very passe, but it's this incredibly interesting film because it's a documentary that's also a fiction film that's also a lecture. It's all writer, director appears in it, Magnus Hirschfeld, and it was recut four times to try and escape being censored. Um, and it was its censorship that, because it was then only available for private audiences, led to almost all known prints of it being burned by the Nazis. So it's an incredible opportunity to see what is one of the campest nature documentaries <laughs> ever made. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'll be here with Adam Smith, um, to talk about it, we made a podcast called "The Film You Can't," we, "The Film We Can't See," which is on BBC Sounds, uh, a familiar phrase to almost everyone in this room, to, which is about what the film that you long to see that you can't, and specifically about queer cinema of the 1930s and the hot people who were involved in it. Excellent. Well, we're very Including Paul Rhodeson. <laughs> Do you have anything that you... I know that Israel has to rush off because you have a Zola screening, but if you were staying, is there anything that you would recommend people to check out as part of Cinema Rediscovered that maybe yeah, slots you're, into you're this Yeah, you're a little... What's it called? Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Queen of Diamonds. Queen of Diamonds. <laughs> yes. Q&A. Rachel and I went to see... Uh, so oh. Nina Menkes, brainwashed. Nina Menkes brainwashed, yeah. At so Berlin Film Festival. It was yeah. really great, actually. So basically, on Friday, Lauren, who is the third visible woman, will be um, hosting a Q and A with Nina Menkes, who is an amazing, underrated American indie director, um, who has also recently made a documentary called Brainwash, which is all about the female gaze and the male gaze in cinema. And it's a really amazing essay film talking about basically how we've been brainwashed by seeing all these images filtered through male perceptions and how we might be able to challenge that um, by kind of being aware of this and also creating images through different gazes. Um, so we will be talking a little bit about Brainwash in the discussion and also Queen of Diamonds is a really amazing film, very rarely screened mm. um, since it was made. This is a really good opportunity. Um, so yeah, 100% come to that. Thank you for throwing that over. Yeah. I forgot we were doing that. No, no, no. <laughs> I think that's, that's, that's an excellent choice. And also, yes, yeah, so we watched Brainwash together and it's an excellent, excellent film. It's sort of like a video essay looking at a, a lot of scenes and you sort of hate yourself a little bit mm -hmm. for falling mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, we truly have been brainwashed for about 100 years plus. Uh, and it really reflects on how we end up treating people in real life. Um, so yeah, I would suggest going to that talk. Thank you very much. Um, you. Are we at the end? No, maybe. I think we still have time for one last question or a comment. If or anyone has one last question to round us up, please do. Throw in. Hmm? It's quite early in the morning. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've just, yesterday I was given permission to put up a timeline outside our office. Um, I'm going to start it with Alice Guy Blachet. Um, I'd like to know what, if you could put up a timeline for students who might not know much about women in film and you could choose one thing, what would you suggest? Because I have this opportunity and I may as well ask. 
Like what? the whole timeline or one thing? Just one, one, one thing. Oh, one one yeah, thing yeah, that you, you wanna, think I would love students to think what the hell okay. is that? I'm gonna go and look that up. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in with a, a European in Hollywood, actually, someone we don't often consider um, who wasn't part of the sewing circle or the salon world, um, which is Maya Deren, um, mm. who um, I think is in some ways the most influential women women filmmaker um, in American history, partially because in a very sad situation, Meshes of the Afternoon was often the only film made by a woman shown on film courses. Um, people from Barbara Hammer in the 1960s up into f- um, filmmakers in the 1990s report that, and they're like, I made this film influenced by Meshes because it was literally the only film by a woman that I was shown in my entire education. That is changing, I hope. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact that, so her Meshes of the Afternoon, which is her first film, which she made with her husband, Alexander Hammer, who was um, a refugee from fascism, who le- he was a left-wing filmmaker who left Czechoslovakia, they they shot it in their bungalow, which is literally around the corner from Phyllis Dietrichson's house that you in Double Indemnity, another <laughs> film to check out where you might hate yourself and you might love yourself <laughs> hating yourself. Um, and it's it's a film about it's a film about um, being brainwashed. It's a film about what Hollywood does to the image of of women, how it fragments. Um, the way that women see each other, how it keeps them separate from each other, and whether they can reunite before they get murdered, essentially. So it's this incredibly visionary film. It's really short. There is a version of it that has a score by her second husband, Teji Ito, so students don't even have to watch a silent film. It's <laughs> very stressful because they're like, Where is, is it broken? Um, it's a beautiful score. Um, and she was such an inventive, so she, her famous statement was, I made my films for what Hollywood spends on lipstick. Uh, which, as we know, is actually quite a lot. So, um, and she was also an incredible innovator in terms of exhibition and distribution. She set up the first college circuit for experimental screenings. So she would like take her eight millimeter film and go and screen them at, at um, colleges. And then she supported other filmmakers um, in the fifties when she struggled to get funding and was also working on a very a uh, long project about the time that she had spent immersed uh, in Haitian voodoo. Um, and she's known as like the godmother of the avant-garde by a lot of men who don't want to talk about the fact she was actually a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Um, she was once like humiliated on stage by Arthur Miller and Dylan Thomas, so I, and she fought back. Um, I think she's just an incredibly important person to tell stories about because she stood against everything that Hollywood stood for and um, her films are still very vibrant. She didn't make very many of them. Um, and she wrote very passionately about cinema as well. She's like one of the first avant-garde film critics and theorists. And yeah, so 1942, you know, <laughs> this this film is made by two immigrants right after the invasion of Pearl Harbor. And it's sort of going talking about what happens to difference in Hollywood, so. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's key. That's a really good one. Ezra, do you have anyone that you want to... Mine's probably, like, way more, sort of, way later than that, and something that I keep going on about, which is um, Leslie Harris is just another girl mm-hmm. in IRT, and this, we talked about this yesterday as well. Um, I talked to Invisible Women all the time about it. <laughs> and it was um, here in cinema. It was here. It was here four years yeah. ago, uh, and uh, just a sort of very incredibly sort of Im- important film by a black filmmaker. Um which just wasn't really recognised at the time, but it actually does stand up. I watched it the other day. Uh, mm-hmm. It was really tricky to get hold of it. But I watched it, and, and I mean, it's about an unexpected pregnancy, so I don't know how much you want to put that in front of your students. But um, <laughs> but re- uh, really important to really do so important, right now. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and sort of um, wasn't recognised enough. Was at Sundance, but didn't have that sort of legacy that we associate with Sundance. Um, and she's only sort of getting back to trying to make her second film 30 years later. So I think it came out in 92, um, and I think that's a really good one. It's got an excellent sort of representation of, of just regular teenage teenage girl, um, which I think was really lacking in terms of anything other than it's sort of a bit like Black Blossom, really. Mm. Mm. And there's a really great article from when the restoration was out in Film Quarterly, if you have access to it through your library that looks at authorship in another way and in fact looks at the many projects Leslie Harris Mm -hmm. generated but didn't finish and talks about how in terms of directors um, 
from uh, marginalized backgrounds directors who are marginalized within their careers how do we look at the work that they didn't finish or that they pitched or that they made in industrial context like Judy Dash rather than in artistic or Hollywood context and understand their careers more fully rather than just focusing on finished studio um, or indie um, feature films and it's a really brilliant piece about Leslie Harris about how she lacked support and how she kept going um, and it's so particularly for young students who want to make films it's a very inspiring piece about how sometimes like working on a script like that is also authorship and that is also keeping your career and keeping your hustle going so because really she had great. it was it, there was success and she mm. really tried like she tried to make a second film and it's just not happened so it's like why mm. Yes. Um, we have to wrap up now, but I really want to shout out Alan Asimova, who is a Russian emigre filmmaker, who was a multi-hyphenate actor, performer, uh, producer, f fixer, like incredible um, dynamo during kind of 1920s Hollywood time, made a film called Salome. I get every day I remember wrong, but I think 1923, that is a landmark queer avant-garde Hollywood film. It's sometimes referred to as the first American art film and it was at Bologna this year. So hopefully it'll be circulating next year. And it's an amazing landmark queer text. Um, and also there's a rumor that all the, um, she insisted that all the crew were queer on it. Um, and she basically just employed all her friends and secretly directed it as well, even though she wasn't credited as director. So super interesting person. And also if you look at the stills, Google it, amazing. amazing. It's hard. wild, yeah. It's yeah. Crazy stuff. Mad. Thank you for listening and yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There were there is an evaluation slide, I think. So if you can give your feedback, that would be amazing. Um, and thanks for coming. Enjoy your day. Let's do it. Have this whole section of what like you saw the high production.